My appreciation for things technological can make it difficult to watch good working technology get lost to a recycle pile just because of age. So when I was asked to add this Dell Dimension E510 to the city's electronics recycle pile, I thought instead of sealing its fate, maybe I could clean it up, keep it running a little while longer. After all, I found a way to keep this free Dell Dimension L800R running after being left out in the elements at a local pond slash thrift slash secondhand... Uh, I, I don't remember the store. I only remember it wasn't around long, so I'm questioning just how honest of a business it really was in retrospect. But the point is, I threw in some parts and got that machine running just fine, so why not take those parts and add them to his distant cousin, this Dell Dimension E510, and get a better spec out Windows XP machine? In this video, I'm going to take the parts that I used to upgrade this Dell Dimension L800R and transfer them over to this Dell Dimension E510. Now, the reason why I'm doing this is because I want to A, save money with parts I've already purchased, and B, the parts in here are good enough for this machine as well. But before we do any of that, this machine needs a cleaning. And boy, did this machine need a good cleaning. I went to work with a terry cloth rag and some Windex. This made for a good start to what appeared to be the effects of smoking and gave me confidence that this machine could indeed be brought back to its former glory. For these ventilation grills, multiple cotton swabs along with some isopropyl alcohol were necessary to get all that gunk out. A few more shots of cleaning ASMR and we have ourselves a respectable looking PC on the outside. Okay, so we've got the outside of the case cleaned up pretty well, but now we have to take a look at the inside. And that worries me. Oh boy, I warned you, but given that it probably hasn't ever been cleaned internally in its life, this probably isn't as bad as it could be. I grabbed my vacuum and went to work sucking up all the ash, dirt, and dust that I could. Then back to the terry cloth and Windex routine, along with a pair of tweezers for the nitty gritty parts. Everywhere from the bottom to the CPU fan to the hard drive enclosures. If I could get to it, I scrubbed it down. With the easy to reach spots inside the case out of the way, I turned my attention to the CPU cooling portion of the cleanup, and that was quite frankly, concerning. Oh, good going. The current state of this CPU cooler made the rest of the unit feel like it just needed light airing out. That CPU could use some fresh thermal paste too. I started off by tackling the heat sink, and despite my poor vacuum trying, this would take good old fashioned elbow grease and more cotton swabs to get out. When I felt satisfied with the heat sink, I turned my attention to the fan. It took a moment to figure out how to detach it, but after I got it off, I went to work on the fan blades and every corner I could fit a cotton swab into. It was during this cleaning I figured gloves might be best suited to finish this cleaning job up. I took an old toothbrush and some more isopropyl alcohol and went to work on that tar and dust surrounding the CPU. With the top of the motherboard looking much better than before, I removed the board from the interior and gave the area beneath the board a once over with a terry cloth. With the motherboard clean to my satisfaction, I reinstalled it into the chassis and took an isopropyl alcohol swab to the CPU removing the original thermal paste along with removing the paste from the bottom of the heat sink. Once I reinstalled the fan, I applied fresh thermal paste from the previous project to the CPU. I was now ready to reapply the heat sink, which, as you can see from this time lapse, it took me a minute to figure out how it was supposed to go back on. Turns out I had the heat sink attached in the opposite direction from how it was supposed to be. A quick swap in direction and we were good to go. Now it's been a week since the last time I was inside this machine, and that's because I realized something. I got the rest of the machine cleaned here as, as best I could, given the circumstances of how much dirt, dust, and other stuff was in here, and all the nooks and crannies and such, but I realized something. After I got all this cleaned up, there's still the matter of the power supply. Now you can see here, on the side here, there's a grill area with the, which allows air to flow through here, but um, the thing is, if the rest of this machine was very dirty and dusty and such and needed a good cleaning, what do you think the power supply is going to entail? With that, I decided it was best to go ahead and pick up a new power supply. So I picked up this EVGA 510BP power supply. I got it on Amazon for just under $30. It was on sale at the time, and I figured this would probably be the best bang for the buck if I'm trying to get uh, away with cleaning this up and restoring it as cheaply as possible. So. What we're going to do here is go ahead and replace this 300 watt power supply 
with this 510 baby. After unplugging all the cables this power supply was currently using for the machine, I tackled the four screws holding the original power in place using a regular Phillips screwdriver. Once removed, I discovered a blue plastic piece that appeared to hold the original power supply in place. Thankfully, I didn't find it necessary to reinstall for the new power supply. As for the actual installation of the power supply, it went without a hitch. With the unit in place, I just need to match all the cables to their counterpart ports. I'll admit though, this one here gave me trouble, the GPU power plug. My trouble was I couldn't find the right cable to match it. At one point I had myself thinking, was this some kind of proprietary power port from Dell? Turns out no. It was one of those cases where if it were a snake it would have bit me. After everything else was plugged in, we were finally approaching the fun part, turning the thing on. So I have the new power supply plugged in and I think I've got all the necessary plugs plugged in where they need to go and everything and now is the time to test it because quite frankly I'm not even sure if all the cleaning and scrubbing I've done hasn't somehow broken it in some way. So let's turn on this uh, machine and see if we actually have something we should continue working on. Success! Okay, despite these post messages about keyboard failure and a drive not being found, we're still doing well, because I haven't plugged those in yet. After plugging in a keyboard, a quick look at the BIOS reveals we're currently running on what is probably the original BIOS, version A02. We'll update that later. And we have 2GB of DDR2 SD RAM running at 533MHz. Navigating the BIOS was actually difficult due to how sensitive it was when a keystroke was pressed. It always wanted to go down two slots when I only pressed the arrow key once. This proved difficult for switching the settings. In this video we'll be installing a 240GB SSD, a DVD burner, and while the E510 already has a DVD drive, this one has writing capabilities, so might as well have a feature boost as well. Last, but certainly not least, while VGA and onboard graphics may be good enough, I prefer to see my Windows XP running from at least a DVI port and maybe get a little help running some old games in the process. So I'll be installing this Vision Tech ATI Radeon 7000 to help with that. The old DVD drive comes out by simply unmounting the front plate, then unscrew the Phillips screw attached to the drive and it should just slide out. Note on the left side of the drive that the screws on that side help guide in the drive using a groove in the enclosure. Once the DVD burner had been installed, I turned my attention to the SSD, which is probably the easiest installation in this restoration. Simply plug in the SATA port, give it some power and a little duct tape for an installation job that's, well, good enough. Next, I connected the graphics card and went ahead and added the four 1GB sticks of memory to the four slots. I figured with as cheap as this memory was, why not just max this unit out at 4GB? Once I was checked off the list, I did a little cable management with the excess cable. And by management, I mean stuff it all into a vacant drive slot. At this point, we're ready to boot up the machine and install Windows XP. Well, that's not good. For some reason, the machine wasn't outputting a video signal of any kind. Time to start troubleshooting. Okay, good news. So, uh, I got the machine back on and running, and it turns out it was the graphics card that I had uh, installed in there already. Um, my guess is I've got to go through and get everything set up and then get the proper drivers before it'll be able to accept it. So, uh, good news is uh, it's also seeing the four gigabytes of RAM that I had installed, so yay! I remember watching a YouTuber's video about a quicker way to install Windows, and I thought I'd check it out. It's a program called Inlight. Apparently, it's supposed to streamline the installation process by taking your copy of Windows and customizing it by letting you apply your settings and drivers as you install Windows. Really just cuts out a lot of the babysitting process by applying all that stuff in the installation itself. I'll leave a link to that video below. Well, that's not good. So wouldn't you know it, that InLight program is having a bit of trouble this evening, so Instead of going through the trouble of troubleshooting it, I've decided to do it the old-fashioned way and just install it via CD. I booted up my copy of Windows XP Professional 32-bit and let it do its thing. A little while later, I had XP installed and was ready to get the machine configured with drivers and such. I had a thumb drive preloaded with drivers. Thankfully, Dell still keeps a lot of their older drivers on their website. 
When I first looked for the drivers online, I was overwhelmed with the number of drivers they had. A lot of them looked like they were for devices that I didn't even have. So I just focused on the basics. BIOS, sound, video, Intel chipset, that kind of stuff. Dell's drivers are pretty easy to install. Just double click the executable file and agree to whatever, and it takes care of the rest. I made the BIOS my first choice in updating and it went off without a hitch. In fact, most of the drivers installed without issue. Other than grabbing the wrong drivers for the network and audio, which was easily fixed with another trip to the Dell website, driver installation was a success. With the drivers installed, I could turn my attention to the Windows updates that would be smart to employ. But the thing is, Microsoft had turned off the update feature for Windows XP. So how do I go about getting those updates? Well, that video I discovered that introduced me to Inlight also showed me an installer that basically contains those updates. Think of it as an unofficial Service Pack 4. So the card I'm going to be installing in this machine is this Vision Tech Radeon Graphics AMD card. Uh, I think this is like a 7000 uh, model here. And uh, basically it just has uh, DVI, whatever this, uh, whatever this, this kind of looks like S-Video, but I don't think it is. It, it might be, I'm not 100% sure offhand. And then VGA, but we really just want the DVI here for this. Since we're using Windows XP, uh, we can use this card. And uh, I tried using it on a Windows 98 machine and I didn't have any luck with it, but Windows uh, XP seemed to take it just fine. So I'm gonna go ahead and install this into the machine and then we'll install the drivers. Since it doesn't appear the graphics drivers have been updated since they burned them to the disk, we'll install the drivers from the included disk. After the drivers were installed and I allowed the machine to do a restart, that's when the problem started. To make a long experience short, I just wasn't getting a signal when using the DVI port. I spent probably the next hour or so playing around with it, disabling the Intel chipset drivers thinking maybe they were causing a conflict or something. The VGA portion of the card seemed to work, but I just never seemed to be able to get a signal from the DVI port. I even checked the monitor settings. After a lot of troubleshooting, plugging and unplugging of cables and restarting and playing around with the settings, I think I finally got this machine how I want it to be running. We cleaned it out. We installed some fresh components into it, an SSD, a graphics card, a DVD burner. And uh, yeah, this machine is, hopefully this will be a uh, great uh, retro Windows XP gaming machine. Now the graphics card I, ha I have in here is, uh, it's kind of a low profile. I mean, it'll probably get the job done in a pinch, but uh, I'm wondering if you have any suggestions as to which kind of graphics card I could consider updating and upgrading to. Uh, if you have a favorite, uh, let me know in the comments below. But for now, I'm gonna go ahead and install some more software on this machine and enjoy it. Now what good is an old school gaming machine without any games? Granted, these may not be the most remembered games in history, but I remember them. And after all, wasn't that the point of this project? Reliving childhood memories? Giving old technology another chance? If you enjoyed this video, I've got a few other videos you might like as well. Thank you for watching.